Okay, in our video series on infectious medicine, in this video, we are going to talk about typhoid. We are going to discuss the presentation and the diagnosis as well as the treatment of typhoid in detail. First of all, typhoid and paratyphoid fever is caused by bacteria Salmonella typhi and paratyphi, in which the type Salmonella typhi being the most common one. So, it results in a systemic illness with fever and abdominal pain. Remember, typhoid is a very important differential in patients having fever of unknown origin. Its transmission occurs via fecal-oral route. Any food contaminated with the feces of a person containing Salmonella typhi can result in transmission of Salmonella to a person and resulting in typhoid. And remember, humans are reservoir of Salmonella typhi and any person infected with Salmonella, any person who is a carrier of Salmonella can transmit Salmonella typhi directly to a person. Even a handshake with an infected person can transmit typhoid. So whenever a person ingests any food contaminated with salmonella, large number of organisms are required to cause infection. Unlike Shigella, where small number of bacteria can cause infection. In typhoid, large number of salmonella bacteria are required to cause infection. These bacteria then travel to the distal ileum, they reside in the pear patches, they proliferate in the pear patches, they proliferate in the M cells, in the macrophages. And from this distal ileum pear patches, they enter the bloodstream. That is the primary bacteremia, the first bacteremia spread of bacteria from the macrophages of the pear patches into the bloodstream. When they are circulating in the bloodstream, they reside in the liver, spleen and gallbladder. And then they are sitting over there, they are residing over there in these organs. And after that, they cause secondary bacteremia. In secondary bacteremia, they again enter the bloodstream and resulting in sepsis and septicemia. So this is the pathogenesis of typhoid. So remember, typhoid is not an illness confined to the GI tract. It's a systemic illness that spreads throughout the body with primary bacteremia and secondary bacteremia. Coming to the clinical presentation of typhoid, clinical presentation of typhoid follows three phases and those phases are according to the weeks of onset of symptoms. The first week con constitutes the first phase, the second week constitutes the second phase of infection and the third week constitutes the third phase of infection. So remember, whenever they, the bacteria enters the body, there is usually an incubation period of 5 to 30 days in which there are no symptoms. But after the symptoms onset takes place after 5 to 30 days, the, in the first week, what you would see is that there will be a rise in temperature. There will be a gradual rise in temperature. And with the gradual rise in temperature, the, there will be a relative bradycardia. Normally, what happens is whenever that body temperature increases, with the increase of body temperature, the pulse also increases with it. For every one degree rise in temperature of the body, pulse increases by 10 beats per minute. But this does not happen in typhoid. In typhoid, when the temperature is increasing, the pulse is not increasing accordingly. So that is called as relative bradycardia and you will be able to appreciate it in a patient with typhoid. And then the GI symptoms will be very vague. Sometimes the patient will be complaining of constipation. Sometimes the patient will be complaining of diarrhea, foul, smelly, pea soup, diarrhea. So the frequency of constipation and diarrhea is usually equal in these patients. And with that, patient will be complaining of headache. So this is a presentation of a patient in the first week, the first phase of infection. Coming to the second week, in second week, patient will be having persistent fever. And remember that there is a step ladder fashion of fever. What step ladder fashion means is that the temperature gradually rises throughout the day. And in the morning, there is usually a plateau where there is no rise in the temperature and patient feels better and the next day then it again takes off and temperature increases 
uh, throughout the day till evening and then the next morning the patient is feeling better so the, that is called as a step ladder manner where the step wise increase of temperature takes place other than that patient will be having rose color spots especially around the navel and the lower abdomen this is a picture showing rose spots in typhoid look over here this is a rose spot around the navel then patient will be having coated tongue that is called as typhoid tongue this is a picture showing coated tongue you would be able to appreciate some white white appearance coating over the tongue that is called as typhoid tongue and other than that patient will be complaining of yellow green foul smelling diarrhea and sometimes he would be complaining of uh, constipation so there will be an alternation between obstipation and diarrhea and remember salmonella can penetrate the blood brain barrier and enter the brain so in severe cases patient can present with delirium coma salmonella can cross blood brain barrier so this is the presentation of a patient in the second week the second phase of typhoid infection coming to the third week in the third week patient has the same symptoms as in the week 2 but with that since the infection has proliferated a lot there will be gi ulceration and perforation of the pear patches remember as i told you that whenever there is oral ingestion of salmonella it resides in the pear patches of ileum in the m cells in the macrophages it proliferates over there resulting in the perforation of the pear patches other than that you will be able to appreciate hepatosplenomegaly in a patient with typhoid so the three phases according to the weeks of infection in rare cases where there is penetration of salmonella bacteria into the blood brain barrier there you will be able to see meningitis in these patients that will be a vague presentation where the patient will be having meningitis and the cause will be salmonella typhi it can cause myocarditis and renal failure coming to the diagnosis of typhoid in the diagnosis of typhoid blood cultures are the most important diagnostic tool blood cultures is the most important investigation that you have to perform whenever you are suspecting that the patient is suffering from typhoid fever you must take the blood straight away and send it for cultures other than that stool cultures can be performed but remember stool cultures are usually negative even if the patient is having an active infection the stool cultures can come out to be negative so blood cultures are more specific and can be performed earlier stool cultures are positive after 2 weeks and they are low yield other than that for academic purposes you what you can remember is that as i said that this typhoid salmonella salmonella bacteria spreads in the body and resides in the bone marrow liver spleen gall bladder so a bone marrow culture is the most sensitive modality but since it's a very invasive procedure so you must remember it for the academic purposes that bone marrow culture is the most sensitive modality because even if you start antibiotics to a person the bone marrow culture will still turn out to be positive coming to the serology the vidal test serology in which you detect antibodies against the bacteria and this is no longer recommended this test is no longer recommended because any previous resolved infection can cause the test to be positive so if the patient has a history of uh, typhoid fever any any treatment of typhoid that patient took the test will always be positive so it is less sensitive less specific and it is no longer recommended for the diagnosis of typhoid coming to the treatment of typhoid in the treatment of typhoid fever quinolones are the most important ones but remember that there are many strains of salmonella that are now resistant to quinolones but there are many strains that are still sensitive to it and if the quinolones are to be used you can use tablet ciprofloxacin 500 mg bd per orally for 10 days or you can also use iv ciprofloxacin 400 mg iv bd for 10 days other than that in the quinolones you can use ofloxacin 400 mg per orally bd for 10 days other options include third generation cephalosporins like tablet cefixim 200 mg bd per orally for 10 to 14 days usually one drug therapy is preferred for typhoid treatment you can choose any one of these quinolones or this cephalosporin other than that if the typhoid is resistant to quinolones you can use tablet azithromycin dose is 10 to 20 mg per kg per day with the maximum dose of 100 mg per day 
Now coming to the treatment of severe typhoid, typhoid which is resistant to these quinolones. In severe typhoid, the patient is having prolonged fever despite using these antibiotics. Patient is having depressed conscious, which means that the bacteria has now spread to the brain. There is organ dysfunction, organ failure because there is septicemia spread of bacteria throughout the body. In such case, you need to give the drugs IV. You, this is a severe typhoid case, and in in this case, you can use injection ceftriaxone two to three grams. IV OD for 10 days or you can also use cefotaxime in place of ceftriaxone 2 gram IV OD for 10 to 14 days. In severe typhoid cases in which there is meningitis or involvement of CNS where the bacteria has crossed the blood brain barrier has entered the brain, you can use steroids in this case. Injection dexamethasone has shown to improve mortality in these patients. A single dose of 3 mg per kg followed by 8 doses of 1 mg per kg given 6 hourly. So in the patients where there is CNS involvement, you should consider using steroids because they improve mortality. There are some strains that are present in Pakistan which are extensively drug resistant. These strains are the ones that are resistant to the fluoroquinolones and they are also resistant to ceftriaxone, third generation sphalosporins. For these patients, for such cases, you can use meropenem 1 to 2 gram IV every 8 hourly for 10 to 14 days. So this was the treatment of severe typhoid. In severe typhoid, sometimes ileal perforation can take place in the third week of infection. In the third week of infection, whenever the ileal perforation takes place, there is spread of bacteria, the feces into the abdominal cavity and there will be peritonitis, abdominal tenderness, abdominal guarding. Give broad spectrum antibiotics coverage for peritonitis and refer the patient to surgical department where they will do the surgical resection of the intestine. They'll remove the perforated part and further manage the patient. Coming to chronic salmonella infection, remember one of the complications of salmonella infection is that when the bacteria enters the body, it proliferates, it causes the acute infection. And if that acute infection is not treated after the third week, when the symptoms resolve, they resolve spontaneously, but this salmonella hides within the organs of the body, especially in the gallbladder. So this salmonella is hiding within the body and the person becomes a chronic case. Carrier. That chronic carrier is not having any symptoms, but that person is carrying typhoid and that chronic carrier can spread typhoid to others because that person is asymptomatic, not seeking medical care and that person can infect the healthy people. So a complication of typhoid is that a person can get chronic carrier infection. Even despite getting treatment, people can get chronic salmonella infection. So chronic salmonella infection is defined as positive stool cultures 12 months after overcoming the disease. Patient got the infection, patient did not seek medical care, patient was not treated. After three weeks, patient was all better. But now the patient is having positive stool cultures positive with salmonella. In such patients, salmonella type e colonizes the gallbladder and causes gallbladder cancer. Patients are usually asymptomatic. And they must be treated with ciprofloxacin 500 mg BD for six weeks. Other than that, such chronic carriers must be banned from working in food industry because they can spread the infection to healthy individuals. Coming to the prevention of typhoid, prevention of typhoid is with vaccination and food and water safety. Remember, only the vaccination is not enough to provide coverage or prolonged immunity against typhoid. Food and water safety is also very important. In the vaccination, there is two types of vaccine that, that is available in the market, inactivated vaccine, live attenuated vaccine. Inactivated vaccine is basically polysaccharide capsule of salmonella. One injection I am given 10 days before traveling to an endemic area where typhoid is endemic. And second vaccine is given after two years years. Live attenuated vaccine is an attenuated vaccine that is live but that is weakened and it is present in the capsules containing vaccine four doses of one capsule given 48 hourly 10 days before travel. And remember this vaccine does not confer lifelong immunity so food and water safety is more important. This is a picture showing the typhoid live vaccine in the capsules. In summary, we talked about what is typhoid caused by salmonella type P, the transmission, the pathogenesis, 
the clinical presentation in the first week, the second week, the third week, and the diagnosis with blood cultures, serology with Vidal test is no longer recommended, treatment with quinolones, if not quinolone resistant, options like cefexime, azithromycin, severe triphide treated with ceftriaxone, cefotexime, extensively drug resistant treated with meropenem. Ileal perforation referred to surgical department, chronic salmonella must be treated with ciprofloxacin and to, for the prevention, vaccination with food and water safety, the different types of vaccine. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on infectious medicine and emergency medicine. Thank you very much.